On our last show, we began a discussion on the subject of evil, what it is, where it came from, how it affects us. Today, we'll do part two of that conversation in order to better cover what is a pretty broad topic. Welcome to Craving Answers, Craving God. I'm Chuck Rathert with Aaron Miller. Aaron is the pastor at St. James Lutheran Church in Glen Carbon, Illinois. Good to see you again, Aaron. You too, Chuck. Everything going well? Yes. How about you? Doing very well, thank you. So before we begin, we've got a few shows under our belt now, and I was wondering if you've received any feedback from listeners. I have. Uh, yeah, I've got, I've, I've got some uh, good feedback from some listeners, o- almost all positive. Um, a lot of good comments, uh, challenging questions, people who appreciate your voice, and uh it's good to hear uh, the questions that you ask, and uh, people who say that it's uh, that it's helpful, which is good. That's gratifying. I mean, that was kind of our goal when we started this was uh, just to be able to have conversations about questions that people have, and it's nice to know that people are listening and it's helping some people. Well, today we resume our conversation that uh, we interrupted last time, talking about evil. I went back and listened to the end of that show. And you said at the conclusion of that episode that we should probably talk about how the world and Christians define evil and what the similarities and differences are. So let's begin with the similarities. Yeah, so uh, the word evil, I think we all know uh, what that means. Everybody believes in evil. Um, I, I shouldn't say everybody. I guess that there are some people who are uh, so committed to materialism that they would say there is no such thing actually as they, they would they would accept anything that happened to them as an act of nature and not assign any sort of negative value to stuff that happens. I think most people though, uh, even the hardcore materialists would say there are some events that are evil, and we, we all define we all define evil in essentially the same way. We think of evil as something that goes against our highest values something that that something that goes against what we hold dearest to us so uh, bad stuff happens in, in everybody's life right i get a flat tire but um that doesn't really challenge my 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 deepest convictions i probably wouldn't call that evil i would just call it kind of messed up you know or a, a bad morning or something like that but when something that cha- when something contradicts or fights against or challenges my deepest held convictions. I would call that evil. And I think that religious people, non-religious people, Christians, uh, any other religion would probably use the word evil in the same way. Something that, now their deepest held convictions are all different. That's where the, that's where the differences are going to be. But as far as uh, defining evil that way, I think almost everybody would talk about it in those terms. Then there are, Differences. Are the differences, are they stark between the way the world typically uses the word evil and the way the church uses that word? Yeah, and that, that comes down to the different values that different people hold. P- p- people uh, agree what evil is, but they ascribe it to different things because they hold completely different values. So um, if you're, if you're most, if you're, most deeply head va- held value is financial security. Evil for you is going to be defined in terms of um, identity theft or uh, being laid off. For Christians, the character of God is our most deeply held value. And so anything that contradicts that, we're going to describe as evil. Now, so one of the th- this is interesting I think is that if you think about there are times when Christians and non Christians agree on what evil is but they it's there's a there's a similarity they 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 both agree that a certain thing is evil but they have completely different reasons for it I saw a good example of this I think is uh, racism almost all Christians that I know. In fact, I don't know. Any, I don't know of any Christians who would disagree with this. That racism is is evil, and m- many people in our culture today w- would also agree with that. But it's for completely different reasons. In our culture, racism is evil because 
Um, it violates another human being's freedom, which that's a deeply held value in Western liberal democracies is individual freedom. And racism tries to abrogate that or take it away. For Christians, though, that's not why we think racism is wrong. And this is I'm this is language almost straight pulled from Martin Luther King Jr. We believe as Christians that racism is wrong because it treats the image of God as if it wasn't the image of God. And so but both Christians, you know, to, to treat somebody else who's made in God's image as though they are less than made in God in God's image is an ultimate evil because it attacks and violates our most deeply held value, which is the character of God. And so that's an interesting uh, contrast, too, I think, that whereas um, Christians and unbelievers in Western liberal democracies would both say that racism is wrong, they actually have quite different reasons for believing that. So as a pastor coming at questions like this from a biblical perspective, I'm thinking about the abortion issue. Uh, there are people who are passionately pro-life, and there are people who are passionately passionately in favor of abortion rights. Yeah, and they're both dug in probably as far as you can dig in on an issue. Yeah, abortion people say that abortion is good; they say it should be celebrated. Pro-life people think abortion is evil. So, is there a biblical way to approach that divide? Is it is it just beyond our ability to address? Yeah, well, so that's, I'm glad that's a good issue that you brought up there because I think the church has really screwed up on this one. And, and this ties in with what I just said about racism too. Uh, by and large, the church has abandoned its biblical God-centered reasons for defending life, whether it's the life of the unborn or, or the life of the elderly or the life of the marginalized, the life of prisoners, for instance. And um, we've largely abandoned our biblical reasons for doing that. And instead, so, so okay, so why is, what is behind the pro-choice or the pro-abortion argument? It's a belief in individual liberty. Now, that's not a biblical value. Uh, the Bible values individuals, certainly, but, but because they're made in God's image, not as an unalienable right, as an individual to be free. So a pro-abortion argument would argue that, uh, you know, women are, are free individuals and have rights, and um, to restrict their reproductive rights is an attack on their individual liberty. Um, Christians, though, typically have argued, no, babies have rights. That, that child has a right to live, and it has no choice in the matter. And do, do, I mean, does, does that make sense? Do you see the difference? Is that um, so both pro-abortion arguments and pro-life arguments are actually arguing from the same standpoint, a belief in individual rights. The pro-abortion argument is women have rights. The pro-life argument, the anti-abortion argument is babies have rights. And so they're, they're necessarily at loggerheads. There's really no way to make headway in that argument because both sides agree on, from the same philosophical basis that the highest value is individual rights. We as Christians, I think, would do better if we, well, this is hard for American Christians, to abandon the God of individual rights and say this is not really a rights issue. This is a character of God issue. And uh, I think also that would liberate us into loving both the unborn and loving women. Um, if, if, if we focus instead on this is the character of God, he's a God who loves life, he's a God who creates humans in his image, all humans everywhere, to come from that perspective instead of arguing it from an individual rights issue. I think that that's, that's, a, that's a great point. I, it's, it's hard to make headway in that conversation because the definition of evil revolves around your highest value. And we agree, most Christians will agree with the world that the highest value is individual liberty, but that's not a biblical way to think about it. I'm thinking there might be some people who are shocked to hear you make that claim. Their individual liberty perspectives are tied up deeply with their biblical perspectives. You just took that away, I think. Yeah, I, was, <laughs> I, uh, I wasn't trying to shock anybody, but it's, it's, it highlights 
how deeply ingrained the God of the Enlightenment since the 1700s, individual liberty. You go back to Locke and Jefferson and the founding fathers, the rest of the founding fathers, and individual liberty is the highest value. And we as Christians have managed, I don't even, are we like, are, are we still orbiting the topic of evil here? I don't know. We as Christians have managed to take our Christianity and to, to wed it to Western Enlightenment era liberalism in ways that are deeply damaging to Christianity itself. It's sort of a, it's sort of an uneasy marriage. And, but but part of the byproduct is is what you're just saying too, Chuck, is that um, Christians are shocked if individual rights aren't proclaimed and preached from pulpits. And, but, but the, the Bible doesn't teach individual rights. The Bible teaches the rights and freedom of God himself. And we, as his creatures made in his image are responsible to look like him and to be like him and to talk like him. And there's not really space. You know, so does God, what I'm not saying is that God doesn't care about individuals. Of course he, and we had this discussion uh, several episodes ago and we talked about the difference between individualism and individuality. God highly values individuality because he, uh, he highly uh, values diversity within his body. He, he highly values that different people are different, but individualism the God of the individual is a very, very anti-biblical, idolatrous, fake God, which permeates almost all the different ways American Christians, even American Christians, but all Americans, think about reality. Okay. What would you say if I were to jump to this conclusion based on what you just said, linking our discussion back up to the subject of evil? The, the evil that we see now originated— biblically speaking, in the Garden of Eden. It originated with the fall of man. Yeah, You can go to Genesis 3 and read that, where Adam and Eve respond to Satan's suggestion that if you eat of the fruit, you'll be like God. Right. You'll be individuals. Yeah. Is that what you mean by individualism? In that... We make ourselves not just individuals, but our yes. own gods. Yes, yeah, the the god of the individual. That's that's the primal. If you go back to that story in Genesis two, that is the primal sin that you can be like God. And so we as humans, we want we want to be like God. We want the freedom that only God has. The the, the sovereign choice. I am the master of my own fate. That's that's what we want, but that that's behind, and so that's behind almost every sin that's been committed. I, I said almost, maybe it's every sin that humans can commit. Every evil will spring forth from the God of individualism. I can be like God, and again, unfortunately, even Christians imbibe this false idolatry and make it a part of their Christianity as though God is here to affirm us as individuals. No, no, God is here to affirm himself for his own glory and allows us as his loved image bearers to participate in that with him, but but as image bearers, not as gods ourselves. And you hear this a lot too. Uh, don't sorry to interrupt you, but you I, I hear this in a lot of, a lot and in, in as a pastor people will say things like well, I'm going to make this decision. I really do believe that God wants me to be happy here. And what they're saying is, is that God's job is to validate my individual godness, my ability to make decisions for myself. And so that looks good to them, but biblically, it is the ultimate evil. It's that the highest value is the sovereign grace and love of the creator God and to undermine that with the belief in the sovereignty of the individual is actually evil. So help me out with my train of thought here. Correct me if I go off the rails. I'm thinking back to Genesis, Adam and Eve are in the garden. Right. God has created everything. God has declared that it is not just good, it is exceptionally good. And Adam and Eve are living in that good environment. There's the tree of the knowledge of good and evil over right. there. Don't touch that. So Adam and Eve, they know good. What they don't know is evil. What they learn about after taking the fruit is 
they haven't, I don't think they learned any more about good. I think what they learned about was evil. Right. So can you talk about that? What, what did they discover by taking that fruit, which the Bible calls the, the tree of the knowledge, knowledge of right. both good and evil? Yeah, yeah. So if we, and tell, tell me if I'm not answering the question the way you asked it, Chuck. If we think of knowledge less as information in their heads and more in, in the way that um, the word knowledge is typically used in the Hebrew Bible, the Old Testament, as experience, like something experienced. You know, it's less like the knowledge of geometry proofs and more like the knowledge of driving a stick shift. It's something you experience. What, what you know, they actually come to know evil in all of its different ramifications, not just morally, although that's true, but you know, they, Adam and Eve are against each other from here on out. That, that's their desire is going to be, you know, a God tells Eve in that chapter, your desire will be for him. In other words, your desire will be to control him, but he will control you. So there's a power battle between the two that every, every human since Adam and Eve knows what it means to like want to dominate the other. You see, the very next story in the Bible, too, is um, their two sons, uh, their oldest son killing um, one of their younger sons. So morally, they understand evil, but also they, 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 bec- they, they come to understand pain and loneliness and what it means to work hard but not get anything for your hard work. They, they come to understand death eventually. All these things are evil. And they all flow out of the great evil of their their desire to be like God. Okay, so you've got my mind running here in Genesis. Genesis tells us that Adam and Eve were naked and not ashamed. Right. So they're walking around naked and not worried about it. Yeah. They're apparently, stop me if I get this wrong, they're apparently not all that terribly aware of themselves. Can we conclude yeah. from that that their knowledge of good and their identity was so intertwined or invested in God that they weren't really all that aware of themselves? Yeah. And that by disobeying God, they suddenly became very self aware. Oh, yeah. And For is sure. that evil? Yeah. So what they wanted was to be like God. And what they got was, what they got was the most unlike God thing that you could have. They wanted power, which is personal individual sovereignty, but decoupled from love, it's just created capital E evil from then right on down to now. And so, you know, what God has is, God is um, completely sovereign, completely in charge, but coupled with love, complete love, it's not evil. It's just, so sometimes you'll hear people say that you know the uh, the most perfect government in the entire world is a benevolent dictatorship with a dictator who's completely and infinitely loving and cares nothing for him or herself. That's absolutely true. Uh, but that's that, of course, is not possible as humans anymore because of incurvatus say. We no longer are capable of that of being that outward, and so we use power. Uh, you know what's the Lord Acton phrase? Uh, power corrupts, and absolute power corrupts absolutely. We now use our power as fake gods to destroy. Now our definitions of evil are anything that undermines that power. Whereas for God, His definition of evil is anything that undermines His own loving, sovereign power, and. Um, here lies the difference between definitions of evil between Christians and uh, those who don't believe in the Christian God. It's probably true that most folks would agree that it's good to minimize evil. It's good to take yeah. a stand against it. It's yeah. good to elevate good and try to minimize evil. But my evil is your good. Your good is my evil. The abortion issue, for example. Then along comes Isaiah, who says, Woe to those who call evil good and good evil, who put darkness for light and light for darkness, who put bitter for sweet and sweet for bitter. So if we can't agree on 
very serious issues as to which is good and which is evil, which is light and which is dark, how are we going to make any progress on minimizing evil? Yeah, this is the Genesis uh, 2 and 3 problem, right? Is that now that we've, now that we've managed to make ourselves God, th- this is the postmodern problem too. We've, we've eliminated God and science from the middle of the room and now we are our own individual gods. In that case, the possibility, if, if, if this is the way the world is now, the possibility of us agreeing on a definition of evil is really slim. And even when there is overlap, for instance, on the, in the issue of racism, if you dig down deep enough into the motivations, you'll see that they're, that they're, they're widely divergent. And uh, but part of it is, this is, this is why, too, this is why that, um, power is the name of the game now. You know, t- t- evil is whatever undermines my power. And I can't remember if I've made this quote before. I know I've done it in sermons. But uh, Lord Voldemort, at the end of the first Harry Potter book, who uh, tells Harry there is no good or evil, there's only power. Well, the Voldemorts of the world, the Hitlers of the world, they actually get it. Evil is whatever the most powerful person says is evil, and good is whatever the most powerful person says is good. This is why, so, um, you know, at the Nuremberg trials at the end of World War II, uh, stop me too if I've, if I've said these things before in our, one of our episodes. At the, at the Nuremberg trials, you know, people from uh, the Allies were, were very, very confused uh, at why the, the uh, Nazis on trial as war criminals would say, it's not my fault. I was just following orders. Uh, well, that smelled like a cop-out to a lot of people in, you know, in, in uh, France and England and the U.S. Actually, it wasn't, though. Hitler had trained them that whatever he said, that he had the power, and whatever he said was good was good, and whatever he said was evil was evil. And so it's possible that... You know, so this is you know the answer to your question, calling evil good and good evil. We have to have some sort of standard if we as a culture are going to make headway against the evil problem, else it's just all of our individual definitions of evil fighting against each other. And then it becomes an issue of power, which, frankly, that's what politics is now. It's no longer issue-based. It's power-based. But we as Christians are able to offer the world a definition of evil, which might undermine our own definitions, which might undermine our own highest-held values, that of our own personal sovereignty. But if we will buy in, we can actually see some headway made against evil in the world. Maybe it's true that we human beings are not capable of delivering ourselves from evil, but in churches all over the world, in worship services all over the world, it's frequently practiced where the Lord's Prayer will be said, and in that prayer we pray, deliver us from evil. So what are we specifically asking God to do there? Yeah. So yeah, that's a good. So Christians need to be like this. Christians, the, the deliverance from evil of themselves and the entire world needs to be at the heart of our prayer life, and the heart of our the, what we do, how we treat people in our communities, Christians and non-Christians. Um, evil is a huge term, right? And in the Lord's Prayer, it's the follow-up to the to the phrase, uh, "Lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil." So there seems to be a large moral content there, evil as sin. Don't God prevent us from being tempted by sin, deliver us from sinfulness. But of course, going back to Genesis 2 and 3, right, there is no, you know, why are there tidal waves? Why is there cancer? Why is there racism? It's because of human sinfulness. So why is there death? It's because the Bible insists it's because of human sinfulness. So there doesn't seem to be a huge practical gap between moral sin and moral evil and evil events in the world. So when Christians pray, deliver us from evil, that should be a really broad prayer. God, deliver the world from the sin of lying, of adultery, of racism, of anger and bitterness, of all the sins in the world, theft, but also deliver us from the effects of those sins, tidal waves, cancer, um, broken relationships, a corrupt environment, things like that. What if I were to substitute the word self for evil in the Lord's Prayer? Deliver us from self. Does that work? 
Um, I think if you said something along the lines of deliver us from self-worship, deliver us from the God of the self, you know, so God values the selves, you know, uh, God himself is a self. He's three selves. Uh, He created us to be in his image, and as individuals, he loves us. If we understand it as um, self-love or self-worship, though, that would be that's that's at the heart. If that's at the heart of sin, if God's definition of evil is human rebellion against Him, then that's a good way to understand it. But if if if, if we're understanding it as people made in God's image that He loves, then probably there's a better word for that. If I understand the Bible and its story correctly, we will go all the way to the end of time, and evil will be with us every step of the way. There is no time, as I understand it, prior to the second coming of Jesus, where we will be able to turn to him and say, well, you can come now. We've taken care of all the evil that's gone. So if evil is with us forever, there are places in the Bible where Jesus says things like, well, if someone strikes you on the cheek, turn to him the other cheek. If someone wants to take your cloak, give him another garment as well, those kinds of things. So is he saying that be subdued by evil, just give in to it? Uh, no. So uh, no, I, I had a couple couple things I want to say. One is that I do I do believe that through the power of the resurrection of Jesus, evil can be mitigated. It's not just that evil is going to be there, growing and strong till the end of time. I, I think that that. Uh, evil can be uh, conquered through the love of Jesus Christ embodied in his people. But as far as being subdued by evil, I, the, what, you know, what's not being commanded here is to give in to sin, but what is, now this is, uh, this is twice now I've mentioned Martin Luther King Jr. Uh, his version of civil rights activism was strikingly different uh, than, for instance, Malcolm X's version. Martin Luther King's version, uh, which he got from the Bible, is evil is not diminished by returning it. And this is what Jesus means in the Sermon on the Mount. Instead, the way that God deals with evil is the way he wants us to deal with evil, and that is by absorbing it. The way Jesus deals with evil, the the way Jesus deals with not just the moral, not just with the, the moral evil of human rebellion against him, but the side effects of human rebellion against him, the way that Jesus deals with it is to absorb it in his own body on the cross. And by doing so, to get rid of it. And he calls us to do the same thing. And that, of course, you know, we can't get rid of evil on our own, but, but Christ in us allows, but by us absorbing evil in the name of Jesus, it allows it to be diminished it allows it to be eradicated and replaced with the love of Jesus. One more question, Aaron, before we end this particular show, and that is, if if self and evil are sort of intertwined, if it's hard self love, to... self idolatry, yeah. I guess it's possible for me, in my sanctified life, saved, uh, justified by God to make my own progress against evil. Is there a way to take up that task? As you know, there are people listening to us who have suffered through the same sin for a long time yeah. and haven't made any progress and would like to make some kind of progress. Right. Is there a way to, for a Christian to make progress against evil or the power of self in their own lives? Yeah. So, uh, yeah. So, um, there's this happened. This this is totally possible. You know, people who are uh, who are you know, one of the one of the most important important moments in any marriage is the realization that you're in it for yourself, and that your capability of being turned outward towards your spouse is basically nil. And how how do you fix that? Is your question. And the answer is, is of course we can't fix it. It's it's we're programmed now through the fall. Christians assert that we're programmed into this self centeredness, this incurvata say. However, if you fill yourself up on the story, the story of the Bible, 
which is God's story of the world, where he is completely outward focused. And couple that with the power of the Holy Spirit. God can transform us into looking more like him. Never perfect, never perfect, but more and more we can look like people who aren't, who don't idolize ourselves, but who define evil as whatever goes against God's character. And we can be liberated more and more, not perfectly, but more and more to love like he loves. So it is possible to make progress. Yeah, absolutely. It for is sure. possible to mature and grow in Jesus and make progress. To, be, to become a better human, a better, more loving human, to make progress in Christ. Yep. Very well. That's our two-part uh, discussion on evil. And we thank you for listening to our Craving Answers, Craving God podcast with Pastor Aaron Miller, pastor at St. James Lutheran Church in Glen Carbon, Illinois. If you have a topic or a question for Pastor Miller, please go to our website at stjamesglencarbon.org and click Contact Us. You'll be able to leave a message right there. Thank you for listening.